summary 2023 financials. So, is there a second? Second. Okay. Motion and a second. Discussion. Okay. Uh, February of 2023, uh, revenues are higher than budgeted due to uh, greater than expected interest income. The interest rates obviously uh, increased significantly from when the budget was begun until uh, the current date, so we are ahead of schedule on the interest income. We're also seeing uh, high user and program registration fees in the month of February, which was expected. So our revenues are currently ahead of our expenses in that respect. Dogs, $21 million for the taxpayers to swim in the crap and six walls in a cesspool. So you're doing this with no referendum and no support from the public. It's wrong. Listen to the minutes for the last meeting, and some people were so frustrated they called your board, one person said unethical, and someone said they don't trust you. At the very least, you need to see how this looks for us as taxpayers. We need up here. They've upheld for 70 years. It's time to fix them. We need vistas. We need public access at the bluff line. We need a chain link fence. The word on the street that a marina is going to be built on this property. Whether it's right or wrong, the public deserves to know if a marina or a public wedding venue would appear on this property. We have the right to know for this kind of money. We need the pipe on the southern end to what is right for the public. There must be something that we don't know because no one would put all these rocks in the lake. It must be for a private citizen. This is made for primetime TV. Anybody else want to speak?
than it is here. We have just little mics, and they're not in front of each um, commissioner and each uh, staff member. And you don't have one that a public you know, can make comment to, and we have to be rude. And in some cases, when we watch the meetings, we have to see the back of the person making the comments so that, anyway, it's just not right. You are spending a considerable amount of money on the golf course and other facilities, and please do what is right. Provide each commissioner, each staff member a mic, and provide a mic that is compatible and for the public use so that we can speak to all of you with our backs to some of them. The other thing on the acoustics is that some of you speak louder, some of your voices are softer, and if you're listening to a whole Zoom meeting, you cannot hear some of you. I'm not going to name names, but if your head is down, and I wear a mask most of the time, and I'm guilty of this too, it is incumbent that everybody be heard. And going through three and a half hours of a meeting that I was unable to attend, it was really hard when you're strained to hear the comments. So please reallocate a little budget money to upgrade your acoustics. They can do it at some of the churches around here. You can do it here. And the Village Hall does it. So um, that is that. And then I just have one last comment on your open house last Saturday. And some of you are aware of this, <coughs> but if you have an open house in which you are showcasing what you hope to put forth on the lakefront, and one of the sections <coughs> is ADA, <coughs> Your meeting facility was not ADA compatible. There were stairs going down and you couldn't have gotten a wheelchair in there. And it would have been very hard for someone with um, crutches or something like that, or you know, a walker. And also, please make sure that all of your facilities, yes, they may have bathrooms, but make sure they're open. I personally had to go home, leave the meeting, come back, and missed an opportunity to talk to people. So that was just an observation. Understood. There was a bit of a snafu with the school, and the elevator was yeah. not functioning. No, and the bathrooms were locked. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and it was extremely inconvenient. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. thank you. May I, if I may, address those two points? Yes. Uh, the bathrooms were locked on the main level. They were open right above. We no, they have, were not. I went up. I, I'm addressing the board. We we do we had bathrooms accessible. We also had wheelchair lifts that were accessible, and we were prepared to use them if asked uh, by a public member in need. Thank you. Yeah, but it still wasn't a really, Kyle, a really truly ADA accessible <coughs> place, and to have to, I mean, Understood. It was to, to have to go up to the second, first floor for me, two twice, that is not ADA, and I'm not going to go ask someone to turn on a lift. Right. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak? All right, we'll move on to approval of the minutes. It's the consent agenda. Without objection, we will act on the following items with a single vote. We have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented 6.1, closed session minutes of November 17, 2022. 6.2, closed session minutes of February 9, 2023. 6.3, committee of the whole meeting minutes of February 9, 2023. 6.4, closed session meeting minutes of February 23, 2023. 6.5, regular board meeting minutes of February 23, 2023. So moved. Second? Second. All right, motion is second. Any discussion? Great job in preparing the minutes. Clean. All right, there's a motion to second. No discussion. We have a roll call, please. Commissioner Archambault? Yes. Commissioner Lesson? Yes. Commissioner Rapp? Yes. Commissioner Root? Here. Commissioner Cotto? Yes. Commissioner James? Yes. That motion passes. All right, other communications. Uh, in your packet is a article from the record. Uh, that is the primary communication for tonight. So. Okay, thank you. Moving on to unfinished business. Elder Lane and Centennial Park and Beach Improvement Review. Oh, you know what? Excuse me. I forgot. I skipped over service recognition. Let me back up and and sort to post it up. Yeah. Uh, so Mario uh, has been a uh, major part.
part of Park District operations over the course of his career, uh, working with both the Winnetka Ice Arena and golf maintenance uh, since, excuse me, since 2019, Mario has been focused, uh, has focused his efforts exclusively on the ice arena and was recently named the building maintenance supervisor. Uh, Winnetka Ice Arena facility ma manager, Paul Schwartz, uh, says about Mario, uh, Mario's reliability and expertise in the ice industry has helped cultivate a first class facility that can be a source of pride for the Winnetka community. His impact can be best summarized by a simple statement, Everyone knows Mario. Uh, thank you, Mario, uh, for your phenomenal dedication uh, to the Winnetka Park District. And Mario cannot be with us tonight because he'll actually be at the facility at 5 a.m. Uh, tomorrow morning, so we thought it best for him to be home and getting to bed on time. I hope you're watching, Mario. Thank you very much for your service. Here we are, 25 years. 25 years. That is, that's terrific. Great to play with attention. Thank you. In a similar breath, uh, Luis Gonzalez, Gan, excuse me, Gandinas, uh, is a member of our team. Luis was primarily the golf course maintenance technician for uh, mechanics. His years of service, uh, number 20 over the year, uh, definitely has a, a very strong impact to the community along the golf course as well. His work with the golf course, keeping the greens tight and runny, working countless weekends, I mean, the crew's there every Sunday, every Saturday, working to get those uh, greens in top shape. His work over the years, his dedication has been phenomenal. Um, you know, talking with Luis over the years and having the ability to work with him has been an ultimate pl our pleasure uh, to be had. Luis also just tri or recently uh, stayed with the Park District by transitioning over to the Parks Department uh, as part of the transition uh, with Kepper. Uh, it was in our best interest to retain that employee with his years of experience and his, uh, his, um, his fundamental core strengths that he has and his ability to you know, tackle any job, whether it's irrigation, whether it's mechanics, uh, it is unbelievable. Um, so to, um, you know, Luis is somebody, once again, who is a one of the founding members of the team and will continue to be an asset for this uh, community for years to come. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Coach, for picking her. Luis, Luis is not present today. Okay. He's, he's at home with his family. Okay. My apologies. Okay. All right. Years. Okay. Great commitment. Thank you. And now we'll uh, move on to uh, unfinished business. Elder Lane and Centennial Park <coughs> Beach Improvement Review. So, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to give the board an update where we're at. Um, over the last week here, uh, last Saturday, we were able to present uh, to the community on the 18th a open house presentation of the Elder and Centennial project that has allowed us to move forward uh, in great strides. Showing different um, parameters, going through the history a little bit, talking through the the woes that have addressed uh, you know, the closure of the, the park and the, the beach site and getting us to where we're at today. And taking a look at some examples and what we can do to not only create a vision for how that park could be fully combined, but also create, uh, you know, the phased approach in those two uh, cycles. With us this evening, we have members from our design team, uh, Bill from Spaceco, we have Scott from the Lakota Group, and Matt from Red Barn. These members are, the, are part of our team to get through that. Thomas Burke wasn't able to join us tonight, he's, uh, he's away with family, but he brings up another component within the stormwater uh, realm of what that is. Tonight I'm going to be presenting a brief presentation here, uh, going through those boards, talking through some of the highlights of that, giving the board an opportunity to engage with our professionals, uh, to ask questions, ask in concerns that they might have, talk through where we're at, and then look to the timeline of where we're headed. We're looking to continue on with Elder, as it's been understood, to move forward and try to get that open as fast as we can, and as we continue to review and just recently from the information that we took in from the open house, keep refining that plan, try to help reduce some of the, the heavy feel of what we're hearing, the walls and so forth, heights elevation, to work in a collaborative or manner to bring something that the entire community can enjoy. So the slides that are here in front of you, excuse me, 
First one is showing is elder um, existing conditions. There's a couple shots here that are going to show you what the uh, lake has done to Elder Lane Beach. Mr. Um, Chilis and Mr. President, I am so sorry. But for those of us who are participating remotely, we cannot see uh, what is being presented. Secondly, if this was to be presented this evening, each slide and this presentation should have been available for the community so just to, if, I could, if, I could, if I could interrupt for a second, I'll clarify. The slides that are on the screen are the boards that were presented. They were put at the workshop. It's just going back over the boards, but not at the open, screen, at the open house held on Saturday. Those, were, uh, those are on our website, and they were posted on Friday. So this is just putting up on the screen the same board so everybody who's here in the audience has uh, a represent or sees what <coughs> boards were presented on Saturday. For anybody that's watching at home, just go to the website, look at the Saturday open house, and you'll see these same boards. Again, I want to excuse, please excuse me for interrupting, but I now begin to understand what the community is saying when they are trying to observe remotely these data. Thank you for changing the direction of the camera. I can now see I can now see the presentation. Thank you. And excuse me again. Thank you. So what's on the screen and what we're showing here are the existing conditions that led to the closure of and the continued closure for Elderling Beach. Here you're going to see the washout and the erosion that we sustained as part of that. The bottom left here, you can see the gaming uh, baskets. Those are present in front of the beach house, and that was the first line of protection, along with other gaming and shore protection and steel, steel um, sheeting to protect against our elements there, the beach house and other uh, uh, foliage, the blood and what have you. The picture in the top, uh, just above that, is more gaming baskets and failing infrastructure in front of that it is some shore protection that is in dire need of repair and replacement. You can see the pier in the lower right. Once again, our discharge, our current discharge for the stormwater, once again, the pier is failing due to its age and the useful life. It's at the end of that, as you can tell. And once again, these are, uh, are items that we've identified that need to be addressed. Second slide here is of uh, some aerial views. These were taken on, uh, August, excuse me, on March 15th, 2023. So earlier last week, prior to the open house, just to show current conditions on where they're at. Um, this here is just going to show you from left to right, working from Centennial due north towards Elder, which is shown on the bottom half of the screen in the two slides. The overall plan here is showing the site connected and what that looks like currently. And then we move into our phased operation for the project. Elder and Centennial Phase 1 is what's being shown. The primary elements as we see them here on, on the screen are shown the redesigned breakwater, which is now more of a curved fashion from the angular approach that was previously presented. We have the inclusion of a nub of a groin, if you will, at the end of the southern steel of Elder Lane Park. This was something that was directed by the board to be removed in the October 27th meeting. As we distilled down and reviewed this further, it was brought back and included back into the plan design due to safety. And that safety is the concern of the rip current and the washout of the reflected act or activity from the water coming down along the steel and pulling back out. From rip currents, washouts, and also erosion control, that's gonna help not solve the problem in regards to erosion, but it will lessen the concerns for erosion, but will solve the problems for rip currents and our safety concerns there. Part of this design also has the inclusion of the boardwalk as it's shown along the bluff edge. And on the outer side of that is an ADA accessible walk that takes you down to the beach level. When you move south of that, it comes up near the existing beach house. There is infrastructure that has been built in there, shore protection, in this case steel sheeting, to allow for that, those baskets to be removed and to create a hard edge, if you will, to have ultimate shore protection. 
This would be the same style of protection that is currently at both Centennial and Elder sites. The steel on the farthest north side of Elder, as well as the steel at Centennial, as you can see and as everybody knows who lives in the community, how well that held up during the 2020 high lake elevations. As we can coast a quick quick before you leave that slide, just want to clarify these those two brown rectangles, can you explain those? Sure, sure. Uh, I'm just kind of working through here. So uh, the brown rectangles, if you will, these are just the way that they imported over. Those are delineating, the first one here in the center is delineating the existing pier that would be removed as part of this. And this is the delineating the existing shield steel C filing that will be removed as part of the base plan as well. As we heard, we wanted to bring in that food truck element, or in this case, the potential for uh, further um, food, food operations, whether that would be concessions, food trucks, what have you, but creating that element in here. So that's being called out here with the inclusion of carrying the steel to the southern edge of the property and building in that element. In addition to that, we have the redirected stormwater output that is being carried through the end of the groin right now. There's been further discussions post the 20, or excuse me, post the 18th, that we're looking at some new design options based on some community input and what we've heard from the village to redirect that. So that's something that we're working on currently, trying to make sure that we put the best plan forward for the community. And included here as well is the uh, element to be able to walk or traverse north of the property, so we can make sure that we keep that lateral connection through the property. So anybody who wants to come in from the beach elevation can walk through the entire property, again, all the way down through the south portion and then continue on to our neighbors to the south, once again, being in, unimpeded by our improvements. The phase two, or excuse me, phase one for Centennial includes the inclusion of this ADA walkway as we've seen before. That plan has not changed to date. That still takes you down to the ADA platform at the lower half. At that point, there is a lookout or a um, deck area, if you will, that is outlined with seal to be able to be secured and withstand the lake's uh, abilities, but also have any water walkways north and south. In this first iteration, the ADA pathway gets you down to that elevated level. Unfortunately, during phase one, that's as far as you'll be able to go but our forward thinking as we move into phase two and to the final phase three of the full vision allows for that interconnection due north. The other element you'll see here that was inclusion or included here is the south breakwater. This is an element, once again, that was looked <coughs> at from a high level design approach, understanding standard retention, what we're trying to complete there during this first <coughs> phase of installation and what our ability is to do that here knowing that the South property owner has a permit in with the, agent, the permitting agencies and is intending to move forward with their design, we're looking for ways to collaborate to make sure that we're building something that will work in conjunction with the design so it will work as part of an element, not something that would stand off by itself. So as we continue on through this, this section here will of course further advance <coughs> as the design comes forward and we keep looking through different ways to create a better so, element. So to clarify, the south section is the dog beach. Correct. So element E, as it's known here, is the dog beach, Omar, and you are correct. So where the existing steel is here, that's located in the center of the beach, approximately right here, that will continue south, giving residents a 270-foot cell for the dog beach. And then turn just north of that would be the swimming beach as is being presented. The fencing will follow that steel, and then there would be an alleyway, if you will, or a boardwalk uh, section that would allow somebody to traverse north and south outside of the dog element, or in this case, the dog beach, so they can be protected in that element and not have to walk through a connected dog beach uh, to, traverse the, uh, to traverse the beach. So those are the core elements of this design. What's being rendered here is shown as potential sand elevations. The further engineering and design of that will, forth, it will come forth as we finalize the design. We take it through the final critique of coastal engineering and we'll, before we come back to the board, we'll then have greater cost estimates, 
and you know, uh, better design examples to show where we expect the sand and the elevations to be held by these designs. Before I move on to the next slide, is there any questions for phase one that I can answer for the board? Can you read, because it's so hard to see, can you read each of the blue circles top to bottom? What is A through what's it, G, H? Sure. So A would be the stolen breakwaters that are shown here. You have the three elements uh, going through that. B, it should be the stormwater, uh, showing the relocation of where that is. C would be your road element, where this way the access going down from the parking lot coming through. Uh, your D element is the 880 walkway and where that transfer or, uh, cuts through the park and uh, goes down the slope. Your E element here is the platform that's creating the dog beach uh, for the dog beach itself. So that's calling out this element here. To clarify, that is relocating the entrance from the top of the bluff to the below the bluff to keep the demotions made like in past October 27th. That is correct. So the controlled access point previously or currently is at the top of the bluff at the or start of the staircase. We are now relocating that to the inner uh, set of wall, or in this case, I shouldn't say wall, but the inner fence layer to have that secured site so somebody can walk and traverse the beach without being included into the dog element. So to clarify, for the past 28 years, the dog beach has been in existence. The average member of the public does not have access to Centennial Beach. It's fenced, gated, and locked for the exclusive use of dog beach pass holders. And part of our motion passed in October 2022 was to relocate that gated access to down at the boardwalk elevation to allow the public <coughs> access so that people wishing to traverse north and south along the beach can do so unimpeded by the required dog beach fencing that people can also principally get access to the beach from Centennial. That is correct. When we move on to uh, Scott, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt the uh, commissioners. One other thing I want to point out, I think it's fairly critical in all these concepts, is the bluffs are being restored and reestablished in every one of these plans. So right. that needs to be noted that one of the principal reasons behind this is also to establish, stabilize, and revegetate the bluff system that's along uh, both Elder and Centennial. That's part Thank of you. Uh, can you uh, for so those who, <laughs> if you, who probably can't hear hear you or see you on the camera? That's I'm Scott, here. Scott <laughs> Perez, Lakota Design Group, Winneka resident, and uh, has been on this program for many many years. Yeah, I, I think we can't underscore the value in this process of reestablishing the bluffs. I think for those who have been aware of and followed all of the improvements at the lakefront, most notably and most recently. Lloyd Beach, one of the most significant components of the Lloyd Beach, most understated uh, reinvestments in that was the clearing of the bluff to actually see the lake. The comments from the community were like, wow, we didn't know the lake was back there. So uh, super important to recognize that the bluff is part of this overall ecosystem. And this goes back to one of the core components of the lakefront master plan, the bluff restoration. Because what you see out there today the most part is volunteer growth. It's invasives, it's other stuff. It, it has a nice root structure, but it blocks the views. So working with a specialist, I think it's Cardinot, who worked, uh, who specializes in this type of vegetation. If you look at the wildflowers that were established on the new embankment at Lloyd, they create a lovely uh, uh, flora without blocking the views, but they have done a terrific job of stabilizing the block. So can you tell us what the, since it's conversation now, what the transfer is between the regular Excuse use me. to it's, the dump? This, uh, Scott Ferreras is a professional design consultant member of our team. So he is here specifically to add his commentary, as is Matt Wright from Red Barn and Bill Loftus of Spaceco Engineering. So it's a they, basic they're part question. of the presentation. That's why they were asked to attend. It's not public comment. Excuse me. Mr. President, I uh, do apologize again for interrupting this meeting, but for those who are trying to observe, and there are quite a few, um, we cannot see the speakers. We get, for example, uh, Mr. Perez, perhaps when speakers and a presenters are coming forward, 
and we direct the camera so that the audience knows who is speaking. Great. Scott, will you please come Secondly, to sure, this sure, position where sure. you're going to stand in front okay. where we can hear and see you. Secondly, I am going me? to object yeah. as a commissioner if this presentation was to be made this evening. All commissioners should have had the opportunity to know that. And again, I would suggest it should have been part of the agenda and it should have the presentation should have been made available or a link to the presentation should have been made available as part of the agenda so our public would know. And Wait. again, forgive my interruption. Published, published and posted in an open house. This is a rehash of what was done at the open house. It's a second opportunity for the public to understand what was presented at the open house, which was widely publicized, and it's on our website. And again, these are not final actions. These are a continuing series of updates, an opportunity to inform the public. So we did it on Saturday, we're doing it again today. We're gonna have another open house in April as we focus more on Centennial. And this, and none of this is contrary to the motions that were passed October 27, 2022. As, as I continue with the layout, uh, items have, as it's shown here uh, is the boardwalk, as I mentioned before, that interlinks, interlinks the access for the elder side, taking from the single ADA ride that would take down where a person could park at each level, gain access to the facility, as well as the beach from that point. From there, we have element G, which is showing that food truck location here. Uh, once again, building out that element for part of the, not only the initial design in phase one, but that also creates the link uh, as we get to the full vision of phase three. And last but not least, uh, H, as Scott pointed out, there are elements here called out for the restoration of these bluffs. As we've done through Tower, Lloyd, and Maple, we will continue with our stewardship of the bluffs. As we heard, one of the primary and or overwhelming or, or vision from the board, or excuse me, from the public during the Lakefront Master Plan was let's open up the views of the lake take down the fencing where you can and open that up. We've done that at Tower to the best of our abilities. We've done that at Lloyd extremely well and we continue at Maple. We're looking to continue on that wave here at Elder and Centennial. As we move on to phase two, we're now gonna be looking at the further development of, Cente or excuse me, of Centennial Park. So here's where you're gonna see the inclusion of a breakwater middle of the beach, if you will, creating about a 240 foot, I believe is the dimension, <coughs> of dog beach area for off-leash dog beach. That is incumbent of the breakwater design that is being built in here. As part of that design element itself, this would carry back as buried revetment, or in, the, in this case, the breakwater would carry all the way back and then buried <coughs> under the sand, allowing or further uh, shore protection and also the protection of the pier element, or in this case, the elevated walkway that is portion of this. The one thing I'd like to note through here is the elevations that these are being designed to add. When we look at the beach, the dog beach area, the outlook that you start in is an elevation of 589. You will continue down to a beach elevation of 585 projected currently. From there, we have the continued element here shown on the south of the property that you would be able to walk onto and then walk through a path to continue beyond the borders of the Park District's property and then to be able to continue to traverse the lake. The center island has a, that raised elevation or that pier element, which is going to be at an elevation of 587, excuse me, 587 and a half, two and a half foot differential from what we're proposing the beach elevation should be. So no higher, you know, to your about your knee, give or take, uh, for, you know, for a reference point. From there, we'll continue south, excuse me, north from that element, and then there's the boardwalk that allows for that interaction. The boardwalk element is also allowing for now an ADA ramp to be included into the dog beach area itself. 
So there will be ADA access down to the dog beach as part of this, as well as ADA <coughs> access to the Centennial Swimming Beach on the north half of the property. That element will continue on from that pier element and then from there move down to the beach elevation there. Once again, we're projecting that at a 585 elevation, but the final uh, the final tree, as well as the engineering behind that hasn't been completed. Once we have that coastal design completed, we'll be able to come back to the board with more accurate elements and design heights. But for right now, we're projecting that based on what we know of the lake. To continue from there, there is a, a little node here where it ends for now, and then that would be able to be continued on from there. The elevations, as I called out, 587, 0.5, tapering to a 585 on the farther, farther end of the breakwater. In comparison, the breakwaters at Lloyd are between 586 and 586.6, depending on where you're at. And I have some uh, slides that will show those elevations for perspective purposes as well. The biggest thing here was the buildup of the sand through this breakwater we'll be able to start catching and collecting some sand through this by design, as well as the beach element through here will be able to be gained for the dog beach. The fencing will be interior of the dog beach, of course, allowing for that access walk through of the beach without having to enter the dog beach area. A patron, a resident would be able to traverse through the beach up and over the walkways and then back down proceeding south if they so choose. Those are elements that are throughout here. Going through the bullet points to the right, once again, A is the breakwater component, B is the accessible pier with the viewing and bench seating, C is the accessibility of the walkway that's thrown through here, the accessible boardwalk, D is the accessible pedestrian walkway that's gonna be started from the top of the bluff, meandering through the bluff itself, moving into element D of the proposed Centennial Dog Beach, and then finally continuing on with the bluff restoration component of this. We always have to be mindful of that component with the design changes and the inclusion of additional work. We wanna make sure we stay on top of that. Can I answer any questions in regards to phase two design at this time? You want us to, well, like, I had questions for phase one. Be asking as they go along, or he did ask for questions at phase one. I'm sorry if you didn't hear that. Yeah, I didn't see an obvious opportunity. So, oh, no, he did. I thought <laughs> he asked for questions. He asked if there were questions. Yeah, questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, what, so, what are your questions? so, for phase one, like, I just go back to when I have observed people at Elder, they're always on the pier, like, people are always sitting on the pier.
to only location where we don't have steel sheet piling to protect the shoreline. So it was the recommendation of our coastal engineer, if we're going to spend the money, spend it to get continuous sheet pile revetment from where it stops at the north end of Lloyd, there's about 100 feet of it, and then Elder, Elder, Elder excuse Elder. me, at, 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 there's about 100 feet of it at the north end of Elder, and then most of Centennial is protected by sheet pile, but it's that gap in between 261 Sheridan, north of there, that's where we're vulnerable. So what, what this plan does is it spends the money to put in the steel sheet pile to protect that shoreline permanently, well, let's say for the next 100 years at least. But in so doing, it creates that viewing area. The top of the steel that exists today at Elder and Centennial is about 589. So that beach house floor uh, at Lloyd or at Elder is right at, right at that same elevation. Maybe it's 588 and change. So that viewing platform where we've created the pad so a food truck can get down there, that's going to give you panoramic views. Remember, your feet are at 589. The top of the stone is at 585. So your feet are four feet above the stone. You will have uninterrupted panoramic views from that area. That The same can be said for the boardwalk which is, runs between 589 and down, dips down to 587 and back up to 589. So again, the idea of this plan envisioned all the way back to the Lakefront Master Plan was to afford people the opportunity to interact with the lake at various levels. I love the top of the bluff, the panorama. I love the mid-bluff view at an elevation 600 at Centennial. That remains. But you could also have the opportunity to walk along the boardwalk as envisioned at 589, not getting your feet sandy, but still have that <coughs> panoramic view and interact with the lake. Or, as you'll see in the final phase three, that viewing platform. It's a dollars and cents issue as to how far, it's dollars and cents in safety as to how far out you want to carry that viewing platform into the lake. That's that's it. And that is something that would be subject, not of this discussion tonight, but as we further explore it and understand the dollars and cents. We, in order to come up with an accurate engineer's estimate of cost, we need to land on a preliminary plan. Hey, this is the direction. So Elder, we effectively decided on, on October 27, 2022. Tonight's meeting is to talk about the refinements that were recommended between the, inter the interchange between uh, Matt Wright of Red Barn, Bill Loftus of Spaceco, Thomas Burke of Christopher Burke, with additional input of our own village engineer, James Bernal. So all that is ongoing, but it's still the same basic elements that we passed on October 27th. In a subsequent meeting, we will re be further refining the centennial elements. Once we have those preliminary designs, then we can get a credible engineer's estimate of construction cost and look at alternates, understanding the, the financial constraints. So that's how this is intended to unfold. Tonight, we're just reaffirming and tweaking what was decided for Elder on the 27th. In April, we'll be visiting in greater detail what is proposed for Centennial. And, we will, and you'll be hearing that we're proposing another workshop excuse me, another open house to, you know, spend hours with our consultants asking specific questions that, that give and take that back and forth that's so helpful to understand all these elements. We're, uh, we're going to be proposing that for April 15th. That will be focused on the centennial elements. So, uh, sorry to interrupt, but please feel free. Okay, and then,
as we've talked about before, depending on the design and our risk tolerance for elevations, there might be a need for sand nourishment as part of this, for us to be able to maintain the beach with equipment, move sand, do our uh, H-bar for sand combing through it like we do at our other beaches to make sure the quality of the beach is you know, to the, what we would expect or what we would put forward as the Winneka standard. And also to have an, a second pathway down for pedestrians to be able to utilize that to bring their their um, paddle boards, kayaks, their non-motorized vessels down, if you will. The beach is intended to be in that usage, so when we look at that for the paddle boards and the kayaks, it's an easier access road down. We're maintaining that at about an 8% gradient that allows for <coughs> the transition of that. So that was the reason for that, including the circulation for what the overall project will allow for too. It gains greater flexibility for that as well. Can, I'd like, yeah, like to add, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. I, you, I, know, I, mean, I know you're yeah. answering it, but I'm not no, sold I'm on answer, the answer. So I'm, I'm asking answer. you again. Okay. All right. So first, I want to thank Trustee Dearborn for coming to the open house last Saturday. And the thoughtful remarks that he made uh, on Tuesday evening at the village board meeting. I thought the analogy that Bob made was appropriate. He said, I come to understand that there are trade-offs. What is our purpose? We are putting a priority on this particular design to preserve the panorama. That was part of the motion that was passed in October 27, 2022. Preference given to views. As Bob said, there's a trade-off. Are we, and he used the analogy of stormwater protection. We're all familiar with the 100 year storm. You know, it's a 1% chance of that storm happening in any given year. Well, are we designed to the 10 year storm, the 100 year storm, or the 500 year storm? If this was a municipal harbor, like Waukegan Harbor, we'd be up at 592, 593 to prevent against that, that wave incursion. <coughs> we should anticipate by holding these groins at a lower elevation that we will lose sand during those big storms. If we want to ensure no sand loss, look what Coastal reported at Lloyd. We did the bathymetry uh, at Lloyd. It's responding very well. The benefit at Lloyd, get 400 plus foot long existing boat launch that protects against those northeasters. Beyond that, we've got 600 feet of the village cooling Tower. So we've got decent protection from the north at Lloyd, from the northeast where the big storms come. Here, we're more exposed. We're planning on holding that, that groin down at 585, preserved views. You should anticipate there are going to be storms and we may lose sand. Part of the requirement is beach nourishment. It's very expensive to fill up a barge with sand to deliver it by marine. We have the occasional storm. We can still get, we can still get a dump truck down this path and replenish the beach with sand without an extraordinary expense. There's, there's part of the give and take. Sorry about that uh, mishap. Um, Cynthia, was there any other questions for phase one that you had? So. What is our, will, will we, with the engineering estimates, have the projections for the sand nourishment over time, like the annual cost? Do you want to get up and introduce yourself and answer that? Thanks. Sorry, I don't want to.
Centennial, that in its place will be the, the Lake Ward protection. There is not a need for that. Matt, can you estimate how deep those steel sheet piles are driven? Can you have a ballpark? I think we have we don't right. have well, I mean, just ballpark right. 30 feet. 30 feet. I just want everyone to understand. So those steel sheet piles get driven into the clay, you know, roughly 30 feet. Obviously, that's for Matt to determine based upon the soils and the structural loads and all that. That's the tight end wall or canyon wall. Yeah, that's why he's got the PDF thing. But it's not like a blanket filled with little small rocks that we have now. That's a very, that's a less expensive, le lesser duration. This is something that's going to last a very long time. Is that necessary given how Gabion blankets have failed. The Gabion blankets have failed, but the sheet pile is going in vertically. It's not going in horizontally where the blankets are. So that's the part that's not making sense to me. So the baskets, the wall has held up pretty well. Yep. So, and that's the part that we're replacing with the sheet pile. The part that failed is the blankets. Yeah, the blankets and I'm we're not replacing. We're, the blankets are in front of the wall. The blankets are to prevent further uh, impact. Lake bed downtime. It may be, uh, but what are we you want to talk about that? Like, what? Like, are we removing them? Are we. Yes. Are we so Matt, you. Can so we go back to the phase one? Yes. Yeah. And Matt, would you speak up? Because I'm a bed in as people can hear. Is your point? Yeah. That red button. Yeah. I suspect the re. So, Matt, there's a microphone so attached to that camera. Left. failed here is because you've got steel sheet pile growing here, steel sheet pile growing here, so your, your beach profile kind of does this. So your shoreline here and here has been protected because of the sand that's a relatively permanent placement. It failed here because of, there's virtually no protection from open Lake Michigan waves, although it's constrained in here. There's no sand to protect it, so your shore protection is a combination of the steel sheet pile, elevation 589, your gabion mat, up to elevation 593.4. So at this point here, without the sand to, to knock down the initial wave energy, this is all getting overtopped, and that's why this failed. That's why this hasn't, and this hasn't. That's why this has failed. So moving forward, when we do when we reestablish this new sheet pile line, and ultimately the, the long-term goal is to have a structure here, we'll, we'll have the sand beach to protect this, this strong the same as we've done here without increasing any of the elevations that you currently experience. So what is the elevation of those gabion blankets? They start at 589, 588 at the back of the sheep pile wall and they go up to 593.5. Uh, let's clarify. There, I think there's yeah. a mis misconnection. <laughs> so there are gabion you know blankets. <laughs> there are gabion blankets at the bottom of the wall. That's, those are the ones that have in the water. That fail in, in the water. Go back to that picture. So, so these are at beach level right now. So the elevation of yeah. these Gabion blankets is probably nearing the 587, 586 uh, contours. So the top of all that Matt's talking about here, you can see the blankets as they wrap up to the Gabion baskets themselves. So blanket meaning flat lane like a blanket, if you will, Gabion basket being stood on end to create the wall structure, you can see the differential here. These have failed because this is where the waves are topping and breaking into those baskets, and because of the larger waves that are able to land near shore, we're getting that breakdown, we're having that down, lake work down cutting, and we're having those issues. So to protect that, we are proposing to put elements in of steel, which it's very hard to see, and I apologize, but to the right of this gaping wall is the where we're talking on the north path of Elder, of where it's substantial, and that's the, the steel itself. By putting that across at that elevation, we are shoring up our protection for probably, what, 100 plus years in, in estimate, not knowing an exact date, of course, it's but substantial. Just say that again, though, because you're, like, I still don't hear what we're doing with the blankets. Like, I, I mean, I totally get with the... The blankets are coming out. 
so no longer so necessary. So, so here is my question. I mean, can we rip them out now to then, try and get? Then you risk. The, first of all, you got to get equipment down there, and then you are now fully There's exposed to your beach. Okay. You are ripping out your what remaining erosion protection you have. You're going to dig out the sand that's accumulated, and then you're going to tear out the, the baskets and potentially undermine the bluff. Okay. We would not want to do that until we're ready to replace it. So but here's my second question. In Wilmette, if these are at 587 and 586, they are above the ordinary high water mark, correct? Because that's 581. So they are, are, is it possible that we can just bury them deeper for this year? so that they are not a safety risk. In Wilmette, they are seriously from Langdon Beach exploring with their engineering team getting, it's like it's a special letter from the Army Corps and the IDNR called like a letter of no objection so that they can try to get that beach open for making some minimal improvements above the high water mark. The nobody, elevation. Nobody needs like, to answer. You can think about well, it. Well, I'll just yeah. to clarify but the elevations. I'm going off my hip. They might not be entirely accurate, so just be aware. Because um, at lake levels, you know, this was taken in 2020, so that lake level was what 582. It's 577. So currently, it is. But at, in 2020, this is around 582. And when that was taken, you could see the water crashing into it. So maybe my elevation that I called out might be a little bit high. So not 587 or 588. No, the top. So remember, top of steel is 589. Top of steel at Centennial with Elder is 589. 588. Mm -hmm. So right. when you rip those out, though, what are we doing with this thing? <laughs> it's just going like to So this, this oh, element that we're ripping out, if you will, goes away. If you know. So if you think about this, this outer edge that's being shown here, the Gavi and the Lankets are right in front of this zone here. So We're building out 10 feet, I believe it is, in front of the beach house to establish that edge. That edge is now taking place of the Gavi and Blankets and they're no longer required. So those, whether they're buried in, if it's cheaper to do so underneath the concrete where they'll be this fill, or they're removed, that's not going to impact the project. The new steel is what is setting the edge for the erosion protection that we're proposing at an elevation of 589. But it's just that little area in front of the beach house. That yeah. area plus the area due north of that, this area here is failing as well. And you can see the steel houses being ripping out and pulling away. You can see the concrete that's being undermined. You can see all the elements in front that have failed. If we have another high lake event, who's to say that these Gabby blankets, blankets, or excuse me, these Gabby baskets here will not fail and potentially erode away the bluff as we saw the void? So basically, a major component of the phase one elder is establishing a new stable shoreline so with the new row of steel sheet pile from the south end of the existing sheet pile all the way down to the 261 property. So the southern edge all the way to the existing seal where approximately C is located here. That's the, 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 the area that we're proposing to reestablish and solidify erosion control from here on out. So it's a twofer. We're creating that steel revetment, linking <coughs> the existing steel at Elder down to 261. Ideally, we'll continue it further south and link it to Centennial. And in so doing, create that stable platform at 589 for the boardwalk. So the beach house is right there. It's just below 589, the beach house floor. So we'll dip down so we, you know, we're splushed with that. But to create that passage along the lake that's protected now and forevermore. Yes. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm going to register a 
a serious objection here. I like this or no in January that I had surgery scheduled for Tuesday. And tonight I'm pretty high on hydrocodone, so I hope if I say some things that I shouldn't, all will forgive me. But if you are going to have this presentation this evening, that should have been made known to all commissioners, and it should have been made known to the public. And the fact that we had an open house on Saturday, and now suddenly we are doing this massive presentation this evening on Thursday, none of that has appeared or was part of the agenda. But that's not a question, so I will start my question. My questions are for um, Matthew Wright. Mr. Wright, it is extremely difficult to hear you. So if someone has a mic, perhaps uh, we can give it to Mr. Wright or he can stand near the mic. I have several questions. One, I understand that the road that is necessary, the new road that will be constructed, as Mr. Petula said, will be used for sand nourishment. Here is my first question. It really relates back to our discussion, Mr. Wright, on, on Saturday, and that is if, due to great misfortune, the Park District is not able to secure 261 Sheridan, then will we have sand loss, and how will we protect against that sand loss? I mean, we're doing this grandiose scheme, but we don't yet have title to 261 Sheridan. We're talking about building a boardwalk with steel revetment across 261 and extending it down into Centennial, but we don't have 261 Sheridan. So my question is, will this breakwater and sand enrichment on Elder, which by the way, Elder was what we were focused on and told the community we were focused on, if we cannot finalize the plan for 261 Sheridan, will we have sand loss and sand migration? That's a kind of a loaded question. Um, as I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, Warren. Matt, Matt, you're gonna have to really speak up. Trust the me. Can you, can you, Colleen, can you hear on the, I know there's delay. Very, very poorly, and if I can't hear, if, if other I, members I, of the uh, public uh, who are uh, trying to listen to uh, this, who uh, may be very surprised to know all of this is coming down tonight. I just tested the sound hear. quality. You can hear, I understand that not everyone's sound is the same. It might be a matter of turning the volume up, but I just took it on my phone. I turned my volume up halfway, and it was like I was in the room. I, Okay. There's only so much we can do in this environment, and we are doing our best, but I think we need to... Co Colleen, can you hear me okay? I hear you beautifully. All right, Matt, why don't you come Every take my course. chair? <laughs> what is that? Hold on a second, Colleen. It's all warm for you. Yeah.
except if you're on a paddle board or on a kayak. As I understood, people could also go into the water. If I'm on a paddle board, I'm going into the water, right? <laughs> and, and I'm going to want a beach to be able to do that. My question is, we're building this, this breakwater on our northern side between Elder and Mr. Edwardson's property. Mr. Edwardson's going to benefit from sand enrichment. He's also going to benefit from accretion. But here we are, and what I heard you say during the open house on Saturday was that unless we have the parallel breakwater that will be placed um, if we're fortunate enough to secure 261, somewhere around there, and unless we have a southern breakwater, we are going to experience regular sand loss. And that's really my question, because, you know, we're looking at this huge plan, but we don't have all the elements of the plan, and I want to know what the contingency plan is. If we plow a lot of money, and we're talking about $7.5 million, what are we going to do? Tell me, tell me, we got it. We understand, understand, understand you've got questions. So uh, the board, I want to reiterate that the board on October 27th, first of all, the Lakefront Master Plan, as, as adopted in 2016, <coughs> included both scenarios, the combined beaches and the separate beaches. Both included the Headland Beach systems. On October 27th, 2022, this, this body adopted the resolutions including to reaffirm the use of the Headland Beach system at Elder Lane Beach and Centennial Beach. Commissioner Cotto made a motion to review, reaffirm the use of the Headland Beach system at Elder and Centennial Beaches including Rubble Mound breakwater structures to create additional recreation area and to minimize loss of sand due to littoral <coughs> transport. That motion was passed by 6-0 with one abstention. Furthermore, we passed... Warren, I, I'm well aware of that. Okay, I'm so not we're not going backwards. Like we're not going backwards, we're going forwards. Question. And my question is not going backwards. Okay. My question is that if we do not secure 261 Sheridan, what are we going to do? Because Mr. Wright told me on Saturday at the open house, before I had my surgery on Tuesday, that without the 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 break parallel base water in the center of the combined beach and without a southern breakwater, there would be continuous sand loss at Elder. So my question is, what happens if if we don't get 261, what happens if Mr. Shreshheim's lawsuit is successful? Again, I'm, I'm looking at, at worst case, and I hope that's not true, but how are we going to protect? Are we going to have sand loss? And how are we going to protect against it? That's my question. As I previously said, you can expect to see without any improvements to Centennial or um, go, go the, the phase, phase two or phase three that we've shown this project, you can expect to see Elder much like the phase one drawing shown. We have a permanent sand accretion on the north side of Elder, somewhat of an accretion along <coughs> the existing low, low profile street pile drawing. In the middle, depending on the lake level and right. what time of year with storm action, you may have a, a nice sand beach or nothing. To clarify, that phase two does not contemplate the acquisition of 261. Phase two <coughs> shows essentially it's consistent with the lakefront master plan, having a north groin and a south groin. It's been improved. We maintain that line of steel in the center, and we put that stone nub to further arrest the littoral drift and the washout. Uh, I also want to point out that the, if you go back to phase one, it's easier to see it's not shaded out. The existing line of steel, which is 100 feet, uh, go to the north line of steel. The existing line of steel at Elder, and along the north side of Elder, that groin was designed to reach the same endpoint. 
So that, that north groin, the tip of it, ends at the same point as the existing steel ends. So it's not further out, but it will have the advantage of dissipating wave energy and created that protected zone for launching and landing kayaks and paddle boards. May I ask my next question? Uh,
representing in gray is what's currently designed and built at Moy Beach. The, the northern piece here is, of course, the bolt launch as we know it, with the outer pier uh, assembled here, with the, uh, the little nub that we have on the north side, the center off-island breakwater that we have there, and the southern component as shown. What's overlaid in the orange is what's being proposed as part of the full vision of phase three as a comparative. We're showing the overlay from the northernmost property line to the southernmost property line here as it exists today. Right now we're proposing that the, well not proposing, but showing that the continuous thousand foot beach as it could be at Elder and Centennial compared to the 730 foot beach of Lloyd as it exists now. The elements as they're being shown here, once again, trying to be respectful of our boundaries, not going too far and trying to find that balance point, that's what's being shown here. The current coves at Lloyd are probably represented somewhere in this capacity. Sorry they're not shown here and this is probably not very conducive to understanding what that looks like, but those coves come in probably a third of the way of the overall beach. Once again, as Warren depicted earlier, <coughs> this beach is afforded by northern protection here of the boat launch, and then even beyond that, there is further protection here as the form of the cooling ponds and the tower road pier. So those wave events, these are being, this Lloyd site is being sheltered from that. The Centennial site and Elder site, as it's being shown here, and I'm gonna flip back to the other version because you can see it better in phase three here, doesn't have, does not afford it that <coughs> northern protection of the launch where it's going out further, coming out 219 feet, I believe it is, to the center line, we're afforded the protection through here. So as Matt had suggested before, and I noted, these contours are kind of a best guess scenario during higher lake conditions, not average lake conditions. We want to be conservative with our exploration of what we're showing here until we fully vet this plan out and take a look at it from that coastal component to see where that wave energy and that sand energy will ultimately dissipate and where we're going to be holding our bays in those different wave, or excuse me, those different climates, whether it's a low lake level or a high lake level. But as Matt spoke and we noted before, as it's shown in phase one, we'll be looking to contain and hold sand on the far or farthest north quarter of the beach throughout here. And then with the inclusion of the nub, which is approximately right here, there will be some sand protection, or I should say accumulation, in that southern <coughs> quarter as well. Without this seal that's shown existing to stay, the water could pass through here potentially and pull more water out, where the sand profile would be even more limited than that. We would just have protection on the north and the far the south portions of that. The center could be even eroded out further. But as far as our design currently and what we're proposing as part of our full vision, we're showing that element. Once again, we're focusing on Elder here today, phase one. We're showing what we've looked at and talked about thus far for phase two and phase three of the full vision, but not knowing what ultimately will happen with the, the, uh, the one existing lawsuit and the property exchange agreement. We are just showing what we have in front of us and showing the forward vision of what that looks like. Matt, I have a question. We are proposing the outer limits, the height of the outer stone walls at 585. Correct. That's the armor stone. Crest of the armor stone. Correct. Crest of the armor stone. And that's yes. how wide at the top? 14 feet. And that yeah. armor stone, that's, that's positioned in a way that there is a lot of voids between it. Is, does that, is that permeable? Yes, a typical row house structure has a void ratio of 0.63, so it's 27% voids. So 37% voids. 27% voids. 37. So 37% 37. 37 voids. Yeah, with the intent, so as the wave energy passes through the breakwater, it gets reduced to about 90%. But the water is still moving through that groin. It's a permeable structure, yes. Where does, it, where does the core become solid? How far below the top of that, that crest elevation of 585? How, how much deeper is that core that's impermeable? Uh, this breakwater, as it's designed now, with the storm sewer pipes passing through it, they have a the top of the pipes is about the elevation of 579. That would be our permeable level. 
take the pipes out. We would raise the core up of the, uh, of the structures up to replace it. We were keeping the pipes, the, the core of the breakwater down to place the stormwater pipes. If the stormwater pipes weren't there, the core would be raised at three feet. Right. And at the, at the, on this picture at the south groin, what would the core of that be? What would the elevation of the core of that be? It would be the same, 579. 579. And that's so the, north, the lake level today is just below 579, right? 578. It's 578.6. Call it 579. Yeah, yeah and, and the correlation is dictated by the crest elevation of 585. Because in a typical core engineer's three layer rub on structure, you've got a layer, two layers of armstone, layers of filter stone, layer of core stone. So as you work down from 585 down to get our the right gradation, correct gradation, and it, we end up with a core uh, elevation 579. That's, that's what you can expect your beach profile to be stable is the elevation 579, because that's impermeable compared to the rest of the structure, which is permeable. And the height of the steel, close to the height of the existing steel that runs uh, through the center? Oh, excuse me, sorry, wrong button. Uh, in the center here, as it's shown, this is about 583 tapering out. Is that current? Current, yeah. That's existing. So the core, the impermeable core, is uh, well, four feet lower. So you'll have water moving through there. You just won't have the wave energy moving through there. <coughs> the water and sand. Water and sand.
to the proposed stair elevation of the Ishmael plan for 205 as it's currently shown. So those elements do tie together, and once again, uh, the <coughs> loft restoration will be part of this. I can go through all the de design components of this, but once again, they're the same design components as we showed through phase one and phase two, just reiterating here for the purpose of uh, the board itself. Any questions that I can answer from the board on phase three, the full vision? Okay. As we continue on, uh, once again, I think we kind of went through this, but this is just a direct comparison from Lloyd, as people know of what we've done there to show compared to what we're presenting here. It's a good overlay, it gives you good perception on size and scale. Very similar to what we've done there with the offshore intent of not carrying too far into the lake. Gap ratios and the size of the beach would be, of course, larger, and now this includes the inclusion of the dog beach element, which was or suggested to be removed as part of the Winneka Waterfront 2030 plan, also was reintroduced by the motions from this part board. Question, if you could go back to that. Yeah. Can you, uh, on the lower right, the, the Lloyd break wall, the Lloyd South break wall, at where it meets the shoreline, that's elevation 591, correct? Uh, I believe it might be a little bit higher than 591, but roughly 591, 592 as it, as it presses into the toe of the block, yes. And the proposed south break wall, the height of that, where it meets the, that, where are we? This elevation here is proposed at 587 and a half, and we're proposing our beach elevation to be approximately 585, once again, that two and a half with differential as we spoke of before. Yeah. The southern most element here, as it's shown, this whole entire structure would not be scaling up, or in this case, uh, ramping up. This is gonna sustain at 585 across, including the walkway in the back half, to be able to traverse southern of the property. So that would be a static 585 across. The center island would be a static 585 across here. And then the two breakwaters would ramp up. The northern one to 589, and the southern one to 587 and a half. Thank you. Problem. Here's to show some of those elevations for perspective. These are elements of Lloyd Beach House during those high lake activities, uh, October 2019 and January 2020, to show the devastation. <coughs> the top left is showing the height of the elevation of the steel at 584.4, which is the shorter steel here. Uh, because of the elevation of the steel, it did break some of the wave activity, but as you can see <coughs> with the improvements behind it, those are now gone. The boardwalk element, which was there, has been ripped out since, and the, or the storage racks for the non-motorized vessels also were decimated <coughs> during those wave events. So this is, once again, showing how an elevation of 584.4 would react in that high lake element or, or the equation. As we look to the right here, showing the elevation of 583.3, that's the outer elevation of the existing pier at Lloyd. Once again, showing what that looks like in that lake environment. The environment here, approximately 582, give or take a few inches. You can see the waves topping over that element and still proceeding through, the white capping pushing across. That's where we landed on the elevation of 585 with a 14 foot crest, allowing for that wave to break onto the structure with minimal passover. <coughs> We won't say that it will be complete because under larger wave events, of course, they will stop, still be able to top that structure, but based on the average lake activity, what we would suspect, that's where we're coming up with a similar height suggestion. In the lower left, you're gonna see the elevation here. This is calling out the actual concrete pier, or excuse me, the concrete walkway around the beach house. That's at 586 and a half. So one foot shorter than the pier elevation that we're calling out at L, or excuse me, at the Centennial Phase Two in, or plan. You can see the waves are breaking up against the steel and up against the structure. Once again, bringing that elevation up, but having the forward lake protection as shown in the previous examples. Here's another our view of that. You can see some of the armor stone we had put in there as a temporary repair patch, if you would, because we had erosion where the entire boardwalk and the sidewalk here was undercut and undermined. So we did that in a capacity to restabilize that for the use of the beach house in that intermediate phase. But once again, pointing out the elevation of 586 and a half and the lake's potential devastation. The last component here, of course, is the stormwater element. <coughs> this is something that has been reviewed 
and we've already went to permit once. We were instructed by the park board to pull back on. <coughs> with that, you know, with that revision of what that looks like, we have made some slight changes to this. I will suggest there are more additional changes coming. We looked at the capacity to straighten this up as far as the, let me start to the farthest. Uh, I don't want to get too point. detailed. Let's just say this is in the hands of the professionals, including the village engineer. And correct. any future changes are mostly being driven by the village engineer. That is correct. Okay. Because we got it in the interest of hey, Excuse sure. me, President James. I don't <coughs> want to miss an opportunity to ask a question. Sure. I just on did the water pipe. Summarize the yeah, question. Yeah. Is it appropriate? Is it appropriate for that question you, now? Sure, but let me just say that the plan that's being shown here was prepared prior to the input from the village engineer, mm -hmm. and so it's already being revised from this plan. So and we will be going into this again in April in greater detail once we have finalized something with, the, uh, with all the engineers involved. But feel free to ask your question. Okay, and who is we, Mr. James? Who, who will be going into greater detail with the engineers? That would be Please myself, wait. Colleen. That would be Thomas Burke from Christopher Burke Engineering. That would be Tom or, uh, Matt Wright and Bill <coughs> and his team from Spaceco as well. All the design team has been working with this. Okay, on, on Saturday, I had the pleasure of, of talking with Mr. Burke, and, and, and I understand he's on spring break and in Paris right now, like like Mr. Burke. But I just want to confirm that that nothing has changed, and the terminus of the stormwater pipe will be outside the stone breakwater; that it will extend beyond the stone breakwater. To, is that still correct? To clarify, what we're looking at on the screen now shows the pipe curving. I can't see the screen. I can't see it. All right. I listen. Then it's a latency, so I'm yes. sorry. All right. Well, then then allow, me to, allow me to use words to describe the Thank answer. You. Yeah, go back to I that next slide, that. please. All right. What is shown on the current plan is the pipe heading eastward and then curving, discharging at the end of the stone groin. Well, the village engineer... I think her question was... Uh, she's still just, under let the me finish the answer. The village, the village engineer <coughs> would prefer that the pipe be directed straight out. So it will not curve. It will run straight. And the current overlay suggests that there will be a little nub <coughs> on the bend, allowing that pipe to discharge directly lakeward. Would not curve, you know, fur further to the east. It wouldn't be curving south. It would just run straight out. You know, I could add. And I understand that, that that's wonderful, and I agree with the village engineer because it lets the backflow into the shallow bay. But my question is, does the pipe extend beyond the stone breakwater? Because that's what I saw on Saturday. Yes. So yes. 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 It does not discharge into the stone. <laughs> Terminates flush with the breakwater. Thank you, Mr. Wright. All right. So, so showing the two elements, of course, and then a, the other piece to just make mention of are these water quality baffle boxes. <coughs> these are allowing for greater water quality as it passes through. There's sediment traps, nitrogen traps, and so forth, as it's shown through here in the statistics of what that is. Those elements are picking up the stormwater as they come in prior to any redirection of the existing piping, but showing those two elements here. So picking up the two interns, or excuse me, the, the two discharges from the, the street work side into those elements, and then continuing on through the 60 inch pipe and ultimately exiting the 36 inch dual pipes. The timeline is the last piece of this, of course. Um, I, I, I want to uh, elevate and show here. Uh, currently, the review and presentation for the park board um, is noted for approval, but we're looking for approval to basically fine tune the design, give further direction towards staff and the design team to bring back the next iteration where hopefully we can be ready to go to permit shortly thereafter. And then on the centennial front for phase one, we're still in the plan review and design. As you suggested, Mr. Uh, Mr. James, we are looking to have an open house on April 15th to bring this design back with any design iterations, as suggested from tonight, stormwater, what have you, to bring it back for the community so there can be an opportunity.
opportunity for everybody to engage with the professionals and ask their, ask their questions to be answered correctly. That covers uh, presentation for tonight, which was the re-review re of the Saturday open house. I have a question on the Comments 
the consultant shall prepare an engineer's estimate of probable construction costs for the improvements included in Elder Phase 1 and shall submit the estimate for board consideration. C, the proposed stone breakwater improvements abutting the existing steel groin adjacent to 261 Sheridan Row were reinforced reincorporated into the plan as recommended by the consulting engineer to address safety concerns and prevent erosion. D, recognizing the storm sewer system is owned and operated by the village of Lamedica, <coughs> the park district shall <coughs> enter into an intergovernmental agreement with the village of Winneka to address the rights and responsibilities of each party with respect to the removal, relocation, and improvements to the storm sewer system. Have so moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Now, discussion of the motion. I have a motion. My motion is. It's not a new motion. This motion. Is there a second to my motion to table this? To table. And it is on the basis that we have violated the agreed policy that we were going to implement. There's a motion to table. Is there a second? I'll second because the material was not included. It appeared on Tuesday. This is the text of this motion. Okay. Uh, there's, a, there's a second. Any uh, any discussion of the motion to table? Roll call, please. Commissioner Archambault? No. Commissioner Lawson? No. Commissioner uh, Rapp? Yes. Commissioner Root? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Cotto? No. Commissioner James? No. Motion fails. So, motion on the floor is, uh, as I've read, it's made and seconded. Roll call, please. Commissioner Archambault? Yes. Commissioner Lawson? Yes. Commissioner Rapp? No. Commissioner Root? No. Commissioner uh, Cotto? Yes. Commissioner James? Yes. Motion carries. All right, moving on to Centennial Beach Open House Day. We're going to do this all again for Centennial. And to, to clarify, we have an open house on April 15th. We'd invite everyone to come and participate. It, la it lasted, what, two hours or more? So, and all the consultants will be there to add, answer your questions in, in an interactive form. We will then come back here at the meeting, at the April meeting. And we'll go through this again. We'll go through in detail, you know, so brace yourself so that we can we can get into the record all of the considerations that we have gone through. Uh, it was a year ago. I think it was March 25th, 2022, that we were in this room and we had presentations from Shabika, Lakota, and her own Costa Catulus to uh, present a lot of background information <coughs> and the genesis of this lakefront master plan. We will be revisiting some of those same elements so people have a better understanding of the sand starved environment, the lake bed down cutting, littoral drift, and other elements that factor into the design consideration. We will also be re revisiting the use and purpose of the headland beach system which is to create additional recreational area and to prevent loss of sand due to littoral transport. So we'll have, we'll have, this is like that section in Moby Dick, you know, that everybody loved to read on Whalen. We'll do a little bit more of that uh, because it's important that everybody understand why we are taking the actions we are and why we are proceeding with the heavenly beach system. So I look forward to seeing everybody at the Centennial Beach Open House. Uh, in April, April 15th. Mr. James, may I ask a question? Sure. For the April 15th open house, do you think we might have some cost information so that the public understands how much this anticipated total Matt is from nodding. Elder to Centennial Beach is going to cost? Matt is nodding his head. Yes. And the reason I ask this is we, if I understand correctly, just for the elder piece, will be using all of the funds that we currently have at our disposal. Can't say that. Don't have so the estimate. I hope, I hope for the open house on April 15th, we are going to be able to tell the public 
Yes, the answer is yes. We'll have cost estimates and we'll have, we'll have a discussion of the financing board as well. Thank I'm, you so much. Commissioner Seaman is unable to attend tonight. He prepared these remarks, which I'll read in his behalf. Since this board voted to withdraw the permit application for the previous Elder Centennial Plan on June 9, 2022, over nine months ago, the board and staff have listened, debated, and learned. The current Elder Plan reflects this process. The board and staff have had countless conversations with residents, conducted several open houses, initiated chats with commissioners, and of course held many board meetings. We have hired consultants with expertise to guide us in the design and engineering for this plan. This vote is an important step to continue to move forward to make much needed improvements and investments in our mo most unique and valuable asset, the beachfront. It's our duty to move forward so that Elder and Centennial can once again be enjoyed by all residents of Winnetka. I enthusiastically support this motion. Thank you, Commissioner Seaman. I also have been asked to read this <coughs> note from uh, Joe Julie, former Park Board President and Co-Chair of the Lakefront Advisory Committee. Here are President James and distinguished Park Board Commissioners. I attended the open house on Saturday, March 18, 2023, to learn about the plan to renovate and improve Elder Lane Beach and Centennial Beach and the potential union of the two. I want to congratulate you on the development of a very practical and beautiful plan, the improvement to these beaches for the use and enjoyment of beachgoers for many decades to come. The plans comply with the hopes and directions of the 2030 Lakefront Plan, which was unanimously approved by the board in 2016. The challenge for each of you is to look ahead at the positive impact this will have on the community in the future, even if there are parts you disagree with now. It is my hope that the current plan will receive unanimous support of the board as a reflection of the fine work you've done to move the overall 2030 Lakefront Plan forward. All the best to each of you, Joe Lewis.
approve the media policy as presented. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, media policy in the packet has been uh, reviewed many times over by the board. It is uh, as you have asked to have it read. So uh, there have been no changes. We should be ready to go. Any further discussion? Hearing none, roll call please. Commissioner Archambault? Yes. Commissioner Lesson? Yes. Commissioner Rapp? Yes. Commissioner Root? Here. Commissioner Cotto? Yes. Commissioner Jean? Yes. That motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to new business, 8.1. Consideration to amend the Winneka Park District Ordinance number 504 to establish Centennial Beach, Centennial Beach Dog Beach as an unleashed dog beach until such time as a temporary or permanent fence is erected to keep dogs from staying on the adjacent property. Now, before I go into the motion, I want everybody to understand we already passed this motion. It was necessitated by the fact that we're not in conformance <coughs> with the Cook County guidelines. The purpose of this tonight is to formally <coughs> amend the ordinance. We cannot enforce it without amending the language of the ordinance. So, may I have a motion to approve ordinance number 596 to amend ordinance number 504, section 2.03b, to identify Centennial Dog Beach, Centennial Beach Dog Beach, as an unleashed dog beach until such time that the park district installs a temporary fence or a permanent fence. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, roll call please. Uh, hey, oh. hey, excuse me, I'm going to introduce a motion to table this motion for the reason that this ordinance was not made available for review by the board <coughs> today. The fact that it was not published as, as on Friday for the other commissioner for us to see is in accordance with our policy. And, and I don't know if there will be a motion to second. But again, my point is that when we are doing motions and we are uh, passing ordinances, the board needs a reasonable opportunity to discuss with each other, to, to review, and our policy was that all of this would be done by 5 p.m. on the Friday before meeting. Then secondly, the community should have an opportunity to see what is intended and that should happen and be published by 5 or 6 p.m., whatever we decided, on the Tuesday before. This has not happened. All of this has been a moving target, and I understand we were very busy with an open house on Saturday. But, but again, that is my reason. All right, so there's, a, there's a motion to table. Is that, there's a motion to table. Is there a second? I'm going to second it. All right. It's got those points. <coughs> a motion to second to table. Roll call, please. Cynthia, Cynthia, and Laura, because she 
she's, yeah. or she's deferring to you, Colleen. Okay. Go ahead, Colleen. Okay. Uh, again, um, for this, uh, the Board of Over a year ago, a group of citizens volunteered their time and attention in the Dog Beach Advisory Committee. I would thank before we move forward with uh, the sense of installation <coughs> that we might have a courtesy to our community convene the Dog Beach Advisory Committee, show them what the plans are, and, and, and elicit their comments and suggestions <coughs> for this temporary
animals and so on. Very late in. And in fact, if you read carefully the Sedarma guidelines, you might question whether fencing was necessary. The Cook County Animal Control Ordinance has very specific language. It talks about fences being required for an off-leash dog park on, quote, land, end quote. I guess what I've been curious from the beginning is whether that language was intended to address a beach situation. And quite candidly, this is not my issue because I do not have a problem with a fenced-in dog beach. I don't. But we have residents in this community who do. And they came and they spoke to us. And so I guess what I'm trying to suggest is that perhaps we do need to convene the Dog Beach Advisory Committee. I'm glad to hear there's going to be time, there should be time to do that. But also, do we need to really reach out to Cook County Animal Control and ask them what was intended by this language? Because I suggested this when we discussed this previously. I don't believe we've done that. And I'm curious. I mean, we keep talking about Cook County Animal Control, and here is a dog beach that's been in existence since 1995. The Advisory Committee did an in-depth research. They found no incidents of any problems in park district records. We then went to the Park District. Colleen, I understand all this. It's a motion on the floor. Call the question. Let's take a vote. We've got to keep moving. It's 815. Roll call, please. Commissioner Archibald? Yes. Commissioner Lessin? Yes. Commissioner Rapp? Yes. Commissioner Root? Yes. Commissioner Cotto? Yes. Commissioner Jane? Yes. That motion passes. All right. Moving on to matters of the director. Very quickly, in your packet is the summary of legal fees through 2023. That amount of $22,170.75. I did receive another invoice for another $18,858, so that will clear us past $40,000 for year-to-date legal expenses. From 2019 to 2022, our legal expenses were just north of $500,000, $514,685. So the packet provides that detail. I have a question. Sure. In December, and I'm glad that Steve is here because I hope that we can close in on this at this particular point. I had asked to have the FOIA responses, for which we have paid thousands of dollars at this point, be made available to commissioners. It sounded like there was a plan for that to happen on diligent. When is that happening? Because it's been, like, more than three months. I can speak to that. Steve and I have been striking out on connecting. He's provided a link with connection to all of those documents. Where the concern is is to make sure that no additional information that is not relevant to the FOIA was included in that link. And once Steve and I are able to connect, we'll be able to confirm that is, in fact, the case, and then it will be shared via diligent. So that diligent platform. Do we have a date for that? Is it going to be done? Because it's been hanging out for a long time. I think it won't take much. We really just want to make sure there was some bugs in the electronic information that I passed to Kyle. We're trying to work those out. I would expect that we'd be able to get that done next week. That's what we just talked about before the meeting, actually. Excellent. Love to hear that. Fabulous. Thank you. Lakefront master plan fees through 2023, year-to-date, $29,040.50, which does include legal expenses, as previously referenced, as well as some engineering expenses. And then you have the total from 2019 to date of $708,518.55. I sent out a quick email to all of you who have not already completed your statement of economic interest. So I know Commissioner Rapp has done so, Commissioner Cotto. Maybe you have not. I know Commissioner Cotto has. But you had to. But it's due May 1st. Correct. Yep. Time. And I have not done it, though. Yeah. You will be able to 
could log in to your existing portal, which you're not able to do with the new candidate. Um, if I can just make a comment about that. The, the actual requirements of that form are very misleading. The form is very misleading about what's required. There's a laundry list. If you look at the definitions of assets, for example, there is an exception for lots of personal assets, like your home, and there's also exceptions for certain personal debts, like your mortgage. There's a long list of those things in the statute. It's not apparent if you just look at the, at the form. So I would be happy to talk to anybody or help them find the explanations that will help you to do this accurately and not disclose a whole bunch of information that the state isn't actually required. So Steve, you actually had sent uh, maybe a year ago a summary from Robin Schwartz. Right. Schwartz on that matter, so all distributed to the Yeah, that, that was, uh, they, re, 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 uh, they amended the statute and changed the whole form a year ago and we did an update. Yep, that, I'll, so. I'll send that out. Thanks. Thank you. But still, if you have any questions, call me. Last item is uh, the village approached the Winneka Park District to provide a letter of support for the village's <coughs> submission uh, to the congressionally directed spending um, request uh, representatives for the village to secure $887,835 to support the Green Bay Trail Accessibility and Connectivity Project. So to each of you, I sent uh, the letter of support. Uh, that was provided to me late last week, um, and it's essentially to support, to provide our support for their <coughs> efforts. We are collaboratively working with the village, you know, predating uh, the work on the uh, the project recently, uh, the, the collaboration on the project. They own the village uh, uh, segment of the Green Bay Trail. We manage it. That's by ordinance. So this is really in keeping with the ordinance. Uh, <coughs> small little sliver of uh, providing some paperwork. So I'm sorry, I got a little confused on that, JP. So the village is getting how much money from whom? They're asking. They're, they're asking, they're putting in a grant application with the federal government to or secure $887,835 for the Green Bay Trail project. Okay. So I don't want to get involved in any more minutia than we have tonight. So I've been told that um, Trustee Dearborn has told our volunteer committee
on reports. Anyone?
that you showed that 577 is way out there. You're showing the high water mark. I want you to show the water mark where it is because the photos that you showed were from the worst day on the lake that we've had all year. There were five calm days. Show calm days. Show true pictures. The Gabby and Basket pictures are two years old. Do you even know what they look like now? I mean, I feel like you do everything that you do to make your thing look like it, but you need to show current photos, current information, current pictures, and be more transparent. I, I tried to find what was on the website and I couldn't find it. So I, I you can tell, I, I have a cousin that was in a motorcycle accident tonight and I stayed here because I'm trying to represent the public and everyone's gone and I just feel like you need to do what the public wants, which is piers and one long beach, no wall in the middle. Can't make it any clearer. So frustrating. Anybody else?
uh, people are already using it. So they were seeing that they were enjoying themselves and they're excited about it. So that is open. We are going to be doing a the soft opening, like I said, happened today. We are going to do more of a formal uh, grand opening, if you will, when the weather warms up. We'll probably do like an ice cream social, is what we've done in the past, and that's been really well received by the community. So that'll be something that we're working on. We've had some early discussions on it uh, for marketing plans, and we'll continue to uh, address that and push out some communications once we have that finalized. The stormwater, I mentioned at the previous meeting that uh, there is going to be an addendum to the IDA as it relates to the inclusion of two components, one being the sand trap work, the additional work that we talked about. Uh, so we want to make sure we include that along with the potential additional stone that would be required into those geotechnical er areas where we might run into issues uh, with less than suitable ground conditions. There were quite a few soil warrants taken throughout the course, uh, but they don't truly tell you the entire profile of everything throughout. So in case we hit some of you know, those unsuitable soil conditions, there has the potential to be an additional cost. First step would be a geotextical fabric that we would put in there to help support the rock so that wouldn't push into the, uh, the mud bed, if you will. And then from there, potentially additional six inches of dig or a foot of dig where it's needed, uh, depending on the crucial <coughs> test. So that's something that the village is looking for support of because that wasn't part of our original budget. And they just wanted to make sure. Pass. What's that? Under the card pass. That's part of the directly related to the card pass, yes. And so to make sure that those are installed properly and they will, you know, they will last, but not necessarily test the time because it is asphalt, but to make sure there won't be any issues with you know, freeze thaw, heaving, and so forth, we want to make sure that we put down the best substrate as possible to address that. So that would be something that I'm going to be working with uh, James Fennell, the business engineer. Steve, I'm going to be looking to sit down on a conference call with you and Peter as well, just to go through the uh, parameters of what that looks like, and then we can have something formalized right back to the board, ultimately for the board to review and uh, hopefully get approved. In addition to that, progress is moving well uh, on the stormwater project. Uh, as I mentioned last time, and I'm sure you've seen the message boards that are up, the uh, street closure of Hibbert Road from uh, Elm Street to uh, basically to Willow will be closed next week, uh, starting actually this Saturday, working through spring break. That's so they can put the underground dig through the street to put the stormwater in and finish the rest of the utility work that's needed. The week post that, the following week, they're going to be starting on the restoration efforts of Hibbert Road as well, which will be, uh, I'm sure, greatly received by the community uh, with the current conditions that are out there. So that's ongoing. Golf course work will probably start around because uh, of the conditions in early April, and we'll be moving on with that uh, as well. So they're going to try to get back out there once they push through this next component and get back on the schedule for the golf course. Uh, today, bids went live for tennis. The outdoor tennis mm -hmm. court, something that was budgeted for the re-color coding of courts 8 through 12, went live. So that'll be a bid opening on uh, April 11th. That'll be until 10 a.m. We'll be able to, uh, we'll be looking to come back with a recommendation to the board at the April 27th meeting for that work. So just be aware of that. That's something that was budgeted for. Uh, Pat paid very close attention to those courts, and uh, something that we need to keep up the revenue of play. Uh, once again, you know, tennis has great reserves and they're very um, financial, uh, you know, very mindful of their finances on how they carry forward. So this is where it goes to plan. Um, we are currently, well, I am currently looking at uh, different firms to complete modeling of the final plan once we land on it for Elder Centennial so we can have those 3D renderings to show the video tour of what that is to show the scale and size and help present the vistas on what that is as in, in its current capacity and ultimately in the final capacity of what that looks like. I'll bring those costs back to the board to make a decision on if they would like to move forward with that as part of this design. And then the other piece was uh, I'll be looking to bring back costs for geotechnical soil borings as we finalize our plan. We're going to need additional soil borings beyond what we've done already to now that we've identified certain areas. And that will come at a, like another cost of the project, so just be aware that's another component that comes back to us for uh, completion of this project as we continue to move forward. So just be aware of that. That's all that I have. Really it's great. a lot. It's really great to get the mid core one up and running and done for yeah, spring. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's really awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Great time. I'll pass that on to Rick Schramm, who was spearheading that. Thank you. Nailed it. Denise? Denise? Um, I just a little to report. 
board. I am continuing to learn my job. Um, with your vote earlier tonight, I have to give you a report that we are all caught up now on approving minutes. So I will continue to make it a goal to get the minutes in case, um, uh, uh, as soon as possible for you in the portal to review. Thank you, Austin. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a lot of work. Great. Great to have you on board. Here. Thank you. Jim? Uh, I have three brief items. Uh, the first, uh, we had, I had intended to have the 2023 budget book ready to hand out to you tonight. It is not quite ready. We've got a couple small refinements to make. It should be ready very shortly. We will get it out to you as soon as we possibly can. So I want to give you an update at that point. Uh, second, uh, the audit, the 2020 audit is ongoing. The auditors have been here all week this week. Uh, we provided them with everything they've asked for. We satisfactorily answered all their questions up to this point. I expect them to be here tomorrow with a handful of, of, of other questions. Uh, they're honored to be not only us, but the foundation. Uh, so far, there's been no uh, material or substantial deficiencies identified, so things are going well in that respect. Uh, and third, <coughs> and I hand out something to all of the commissioners uh, at the beginning of the meeting this evening. As most of you know, over the last 10 days, there's been a great deal of concern uh, regarding the stability of the banking environment in the United States with the collapse of SVB, Signature, and the bailout of the public. Um, I've been speaking with Commissioners Cotto and Seaman regarding uh, our potential exposure. Uh, we're very cash heavy at the moment, and so we are looking to diversify uh, our holdings among other financial institutions to minimize the risk. Um, Executive Director Peterson and I and our Associate Taylor Brooks are going to be going out to banks in the near future to uh, look at opportunities to, again, diversify our holdings so that we're minimizing our risk. You should definitely think about opening an account with Chase, mm -hmm. J.P. Morgan Chase. It's going to take five days to two 
This is, uh, no, this is uh, the first time this is being required. And it, it, under the statute, that once the committee submits its report, its work is finished and there is no requirement to reconvene until a new decennial committee is formed 10 years later. <coughs> Hence the name decennial. Three out of three members? Two, two or more community Two or more members. And I recommend keeping it small, otherwise it gets really hard to staff uh, to, to schedule. Yeah. Exactly. And it's a lot more efficient if you can you know, it into do it that way. If I may add, uh, Denise and I uh, were in contact with Jason Anselman with IAPD last week on this topic. Uh, and so we will take the, the guidance from, from Steve as well as expected information that will be coming out after Election Day uh, from IAPD on this topic uh, so that uh, we are ready to go once the new board is seated in May. Well, the new board will be seated at the end, end of the meeting in, at the end of May. And when is this? June 10th. June 10th. Right. So a lot of districts are already moving forward, um, not waiting for IEPD. IEPD has been kind of slow getting this out. So we will so. have we will have uh, Mr. Tyson and Mr. Hemmings at the meeting on the 27th prior to their speak, well, assuming they could get elected. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and it's already contested, just in case anybody was questioning. And we'll have our uh, existing board members that are rolling off. Making, I got a way bad you. Right? Yeah, make, look at that smile. I got the first volunteer <laughs> for the new thank committee. You, thank, thank you, David. I'm thinking thank maybe you. that could satisfy her. Yeah, she has David, David to stay on yeah. for one more week. Yeah, David and Nikki. Yeah, I mean, we I would boldly suggest for that May installation meeting that we attach an additional special meeting afterwards just for convening the first meeting. Yeah. And then we just check off that um, July, June kind of right. requirement. Right. 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 A lot of and districts are doing that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. And then well, just yeah, we have, we <laughs> have the, end of, the, the end of May, the first is the regular board meeting. Yep. And we will conduct all business the regular board meeting. Then we convene the annual meeting. And that uh, includes the swearing in of the new commissioners. And so, at we, Steve, if you advise us, can we convene the committee meeting uh, while all all members are present? Absolutely. We'll if just we, do the special notice and make it either make it part of the meeting, or as Christina suggests, you could have it convene immediately following the meeting. You have to still have to publish a notice, but it won't be the same notice. I think the hardest part is to be get, getting David Seaman to consent to sticking around. <laughs> For extra time there. Yeah. Yeah. So you think. Yeah. Yeah. Just discuss right. the scope of work. That's plenty, right? Right. Right. Um, that's, yeah. It's that, and I think, you know, probably hand out materials or yeah. advice that they're available at a link or, or wherever. Uh, right. Kate? Kate. Kate. Um, Sorry. Kate. Yeah, working um, on getting more acclimated with the district um, and working with Gracie um, on some different changes within the web website to make it a little bit more searchable. Um, I heard that come up a few times, so we're working on some, some big changes there. Um, the summer brochure, um, as Kyle pointed out, I'm working on that as well, getting ready for summer registration in April. And um, numerous e-blasts and um, social media. Hopefully, you've all been seeing that going out, um, promoting different spring events, um, spring programming, and um, working on. We'll be working on some press releases um, coming up for the April um, open house and um, communication up to the community. So busy with that. Great. Thank you. I'm sure Gracie's happy to have you on board as well. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. All right. That concludes the uh, staff reports. We'll move into closed session. We have a motion to go into closed session pursuant to 5 ILCS 120, Section 2C1 for the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the public body. 5 ILCS 120, Section 2C5, the purchase uh, or lease of property. 5 LCS 120 2C6 for the setting of a price for the sale or lease of property, and 5 ILCS 120 2C11 for litigation when an action against defecting or on behalf of a particular public body has been filed and is pending before a court or administrative tribunal, or when the public body finds that an action is probable or imminent. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Archibald? Yes. Commissioner Lesson? Yes. Commissioner Rapp? Yeah. Commissioner Root? Yeah. Commissioner
Commissioner Cotto? Yes. Commissioner Jean? Yes. Yeah.